Good morning. Welcome to this worship service. My name is April Fisher, and it is good to be here to praise God, hear God's holy word, reconnect with brothers and sisters in Christ, and be renewed and energized for our work as disciples of Jesus. Welcome to those worshiping with us on our YouTube channel as well. We are pleased this morning to welcome Bruce E. Chandler to the pulpit. Since leaving the full-time ministry, Bruce has worked as a parish associate in his local church and currently serves at the Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church where he was recently recognized for his 50th ordination anniversary. Thank you, Bruce, for being with us this morning. Let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We are the followers of that root of Jesse, Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, the hope of the kingdom of heaven has come near and bear fruit for the earth. Okay. Light the candles, the candles of joyful hope, and the candle of proclaiming peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising to the God's promise. But we also let them, as the signs of the world, and the announcement that there are some who will not go home, and there are some who work for raising peace. We stand Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our opening hymn number nine, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
is perfect and no one is without sin. So let us join now in our prayers of confession as we pray together. You alone, Lord, know how often we have sinned. We have wasted our time, our gifts, and our talents. We have left undone so many important things. We have spent our time and resources doing foolish things and have lived as people without faith. Forgive us, Lord and strengthen us by the knowledge of your love and the support of our friends and the Christian community. And in everything we do, help us to love you and serve others. In Christ's name, we pray this prayer and these are our silent prayers. God, these are our prayers of confession. We humbly seek your forgiveness and grace. May we know the peace that is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. By following the teachings of Christ, we can change and we can be forgiven. Please rise in body and spirit to join me in singing the glory of hot tree. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 17 to 23. Let's listen for God's word. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'd like to invite the children to come forward and sit with me, and I'm glad the parents are sitting right here. 
because I have a few questions for the parents today. I'm Mrs. Bubney and welcome to our time with children. So my question for you today is, how did you pick your children's names? Do you have any special stories about how you chose their names? Savannah's name we liked, but we made her middle name, her middle name is the same name as both of her grandmothers. Okay, so they liked Savannah's first name and her middle name, which is? Lynn. Lynn is the same as both her grandmothers, so you were named after somebody in your family. And then Gunner's first name and middle name are both nicknames from my family. His would be his great-grandfather and his uncle. Oh, so it's Gunner, what's the middle name? What is it? Buddy. Gunner Buddy, and those are nicknames from both from grandparents. That's wonderful. I know that um, my middle name was my father's mother's name. Right? My first name, and do you know what your names mean? Oh, I wanted to ask you that too. Do you know what your names mean? Well, I looked them up. I can tell you. <laughs> I looked them up. Gunner means warrior. Wow, that's a strong name. And Savannah means a treeless plain. A plain is a, an area of land, right? But there's lots of cities named Savannah too, right? Some beautiful cities named Savannah. And um, I was hoping Macy would be here with us today, but she couldn't be. She made, her name means weapon or hill, and Blake means, which I find very funny, it can mean dark, black, bright, shiny, or pale. <laughs> So I've told you before, my name means, Colleen means girl. It's a Gaelic word for girl. My middle name, Cora, means maiden, but I'm going to go with fair maiden. Okay? Right, I'm fair maiden, call me that anytime you like. All right, so in today's scripture passage that Mrs. Fisher just read to us, we learn how Mary and Joseph pick out a name for their baby their baby Jesus. Did you, did you hear the story or were you nervous about having to do the reading? Yeah. Well, in that story, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him that um, he is to name the, the baby that Mary is going to have Jesus. And you know what? An angel came to Mary in a dream and told her the same thing. So I really don't think they had much choice other than to name the baby Jesus, right? So I was wondering, what does Jesus mean? Hmm. Well, if we go back to the scripture passage we heard this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, it said, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, uh, Joseph, appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus means he saves. But it goes on to say, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. So Jesus, Emmanuel, means God is with us and God is going to save us. So the name that Joseph and Mary gave to him means God is with us. So when we want to know what God is like, we can look to Jesus because it means God is with us. So. And Jesus once said, if you have seen me, you have seen God. And what I say, God says. And what I do, God does. So what are some things that Jesus did or said? Do you remember anything he said? Did he, or did? Did he feed people who were hungry? God does that too. All right. Did he heal people who were sick? God does that too. Hmm. Did he befriend people who most people didn't want anything to do with? He did, he did, and God 
does that too. He fed the hungry, he healed people, he welcomed what many people would call outcasts. Did he forgive people? Did Jesus forgive people? God does that too. Did he love people? God does that too. God is invisible, so we can't see him, right? But Jesus lived on earth, and we can, he could be seen, he could be heard, um, he could be touched. He's kind of like a skin and bones God, right? And so we can learn more about what God is and who God is when we look at Jesus. And you know what? That's really what celebrating Christmas is all about, is knowing that God gave us Jesus and that Jesus is God's son. And we can learn more about God, who is sometimes a mystery to us when we learn more about Jesus. Why don't we have a prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for sending Jesus. We can know you better because you sent him. Help us to remember that during this Christmas season, now I'd like to invite you to come forward and over here if you'd like to do a little activity. It's good to be back again. And, and by the way, when I came in the church, I came in the back and I was impressed by all those crushes. And then as I wandered around your church, I continued to be impressed by all those crushes. And needless to say, I wasn't too surprised when I asked Colleen, are you the one responsible for these crushes? And she is. I don't know what a gem, whether you know what a gem you have, but she is wonderful. She is great. She's very, very helpful for people like me coming. Um, she kind of lets us know what to do and how to do it. Um, so maybe we should give a little round of applause for Colleen. Um, there were five major authors of the New Testament, and each one tried to describe how Jesus, the special gift from God, um, who he is, how he came to be, describe that specialness about Jesus. It's kind of a mystery, and so that's why you have some very different stories about the beginnings of Jesus. Um, one of those authors, obviously, is Paul, and he is the first, in terms of the one closest to the time of Jesus, when he wrote around 50, 55 AD. And he never described anything about the birth of Jesus. There's no Christmas stories in any of Paul's letters. He simply describes Jesus as the second Adam. On the other hand, on the other extreme, there is the Gospel of John, which was actually written, at least the last one to have been written, probably about 80, 90 AD. He describes the beginning of Jesus as starting off in the beginning of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Many scholars say that the word, which in Greek is logos, means those words or messages to mankind that God had intended from the very beginning and that came down to us through the prophets and eventually that embodied in Christ. Then you have Matthew and Luke, the Christmas stories, and they really talk about that special gift coming uh, during the Christmas narratives, and we're all very familiar with them. And then there's Mark, and you might wonder why I chose Mark as the next scripture lesson. But Mark actually is the oldest gospel that was written. Um, oldest in the sense that it was probably the closest to the time of Jesus, just a little bit after Paul wrote. Mark doesn't also doesn't say anything about the birth of Christ. He talks about Christ becoming the Son of God during his baptism. Uh, some scholars call it adoptionism, that he became God's Son very special at the time of baptism. So in talking about the beginnings of when God's gift to us really kind of started, there are different stories. And the Gospel of Mark is very significant. It's just different than the Christmas story. So let me now read from the Gospel of Mark, starting with the very first verse. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole of Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. 
Now John was clothed with camel's ear, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am very well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, have you ever received a totally unexpected gift? A gift that ended up being the best gift you've ever had? Have you ever received a gift that you didn't even know you wanted, but later you just couldn't live without? Have you ever received a gift that, wasn't, that you hadn't told Santa about, or wasn't on your wish list, but that you hadn't seen in Home Depot, or in the shopping networks on TV, but later you felt it was just the best? I know my wife Sarah felt that way the year that I gave her a writing lawnmower. <laughs> she never expected it, but it did make her life much easier and better. <laughs> Gifts are great, but they are even better when they are unexpected and not anticipated. They're even better when they are a total surprise, and they are absolutely perfect when they change your life. In so many ways, the birth of Jesus was an unexpected gift. A gift from God, and a gift that changed humanity for all times, and in many ways that we never expected. 2,000 years ago, the people of Israel were waiting for Messiah, for someone who would change their lives, and they were not expecting a little baby born in a manger. As you may remember, the high point of ancient Jewish history had been in 1000 BC, that's 3,000 years ago, when David was king. And King David had ruled all of Israel. He was their political leader, their religious leader, and the leader of that part of the world. And then life changed. In 922, the kingdom was divided into Judah and Israel again. In 721 BC, the Jewish people were conquered by the Assyrians who were then conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were replaced by the Persians. They were replaced by the Greeks. And then in 63 BC, the Romans came and Pompey entered Jerusalem. In the years before Jesus was born, the Jewish people were waiting for someone to save them. They were waiting for a savior. They were waiting for Messiah. They were waiting for a king. Some of the people expected a great military leader. They wanted another King David, someone who would drive away the Romans and rebuild the temple in all its glory and establish Israel as a leader among nations. The Maccabeans in 167 BC, the Zealots in Jesus' time, and the leaders of the later revolution in 66 AD, they all had visions of a military victory over the Romans. They had visions of a military leader who would lead them, who could save the body and soul of Israel through military might. Others expected a savvy political leader like Moses, who could lead them out of the wilderness and out of their despair and into another world. They expected a political leader who could confront the Romans and negotiate without bloodshed and get their freedom again. Others expected a spiritual leader they wanted to escape from the world. They wanted to follow a mystic or live like John the Baptist in the Essenes out in the wilderness. They wanted a prophet like Elijah or Jeremiah. They wanted a high priest to give them salvation. 2,000 years ago, if people had written God on Christmas Eve, they would have written, Dear God, we want to be free. Give us another King David. We want to have faith. Give us a man like Moses. We want spiritual peace. Give us a prophet like Elijah. And instead, God gave them a poor little carpenter's baby, born in the manger. Born in the presence of some simple, everyday shepherds, visited by three very strange men from the east, 
and surrounded by a mysterious host of heavenly angels. Yes, instead of another David, or Moses, or Elijah, God sent them a poor little poor baby. He sent them a baby. His parents, in fact, then had to flee their home a few years later, after he was born. His parents then became refugees and asylum seekers because Herod wanted to kill all the babies under two years old. Yes, if you consider all the hopes and dreams of the Israelites, if you think about what everyone expected, the birth of Jesus was totally bizarre, completely bewildering, and utterly baffling. To be sure, his birth that way, his presence in the world at that time, was completely unexpected and unforeseen. And if we're very, very honest with ourselves, we have to acknowledge that we'll never know what really happened on Christmas. We'll never know if Mary really was a pregnant woman, a pregnant virgin, or just a young pregnant girl. We'll never know if there really was a host of angels or three wise men from the East. We'll never really know if Jesus was born in the way Matthew and Luke described it, or if Joseph really could trace his ancestry back to David and Abraham, or even further to Adam and Eve. We'll never know if his parents really did become refugees when he was young. What's important, however, is that Matthew and Luke, who either knew Jesus personally, but probably most likely they knew people that knew Jesus personally, they wanted to say something very special about Jesus by describing his birth. They wanted to describe something that was simply inexplicable and unexpected. And undescribable. They wanted to say that somehow Jesus was the Son of Man, born of a man and woman, but also the Son of God. He was the way, the truth, and the life. The birth stories we celebrate at Christmas appear only in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, as I mentioned, and both of those writers were the only ones to carefully trace the genealogy of Jesus, not through Mary, but through Joseph. Obviously, they knew that that was kind of illogical when you think about it. How can you describe the birth of Jesus through a virgin on one hand, but having some real interesting history of the genealogy of Joseph? But they wanted to say that Jesus was related to all men and women, and very closely to God. They wanted to say he was the Son of God, born in very special ways. They wanted to say, not that he was God, but that he was divine. They weren't trying to say he was God, just that he was divine. The special, special place in God's life. Later in their references to God as his father, they reinforced that notion. They reinforced the fact that Jesus could represent God's will and do God's work. And do things like the miracles, which Colleen talked about with the kids this morning, that he could share with us and represent God's word and represent God's will for us. Simply stated, throughout each one of the four Gospels, the authors are trying to say that Jesus was special. He was different. He was the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. And they did that in different ways but all trying to describe that same relationship. For instance, remember I mentioned the Gospel of John talks about the beginnings of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Mark describes how Jesus becomes God's Son much later during his baptism. Matthew, Luke used the Christmas stories. Again, in each case, the Gospel writers were trying to describe the undescribable. They were trying to write about a relationship between Jesus and God that simply was impossible for us to really understand, and yet they knew it was there. Like so many truths in life, Jesus does come to us in a way that sometimes is unpredictable, unanticipated, and unforeseen. Like so many unexpected gifts, Jesus was a gift that was a total surprise, but it also turned out to be the best gift of all. It was a gift that taught us what is meaningful in life and what is real and what is not real. He's the gift that gives us meaning and purpose. 
this Christmas, let's not forget that gift that was given to us by God. Let's not forget that gift that is still with us and is given every year. It's that one gift we didn't know we were getting. The one gift that God has given us that has made all the difference in the world and all the difference in our lives. The gift that really is the way, the truth, and the life to understanding God. In closing, let me share with you one of my favorite stories. There was a powerful king who had three daughters. And he loved his daughters, and he wanted to show his love for them by building a great cathedral. And when the cathedral was finished, the king and his daughters went through it, and it was beautiful. And the daughters were in awe of the beautiful windows and the gorgeous artwork and the perfect sculptures and woodwork. But the daughters noticed that there were no lights. There were no light stands. No way to keep the cathedral lit at night. Yes, said the king, there are no lights. But I have given small torches to all the people of the village. And when they worship here in the church, the cathedral, it will be lit. And that's how it should be. But when they leave, the light will go with them. And they will take the light into their homes and into their lives, and it will be with them and be a part of them. And that's how it should be. The light of God should not be kept here. It should be with you and be a part of you and go with you wherever you are in the world. It's a gift from God. Take it with you. It should go with you silently, but be with you every day and be with you always. That's the gift of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, be with us this year. Help us to see you in new ways. Help us to see you in the unexpected, to recognize you in strange places. And help us to understand you when you come, packaged in swaddling clothes. Yes, Lord, help us understand that you come to us in ways we don't anticipate, in situations we can't control, and in experiences we can't understand. Come to us as a sound gift affect our lives in special ways and live in us and with all the people of the world. Amen. Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once for all. Jesus of 
yesterday. I didn't even have a chance to figure out how much money the youth group made that will benefit their summer mission trip, but it was a great morning. Um, I'd also like to point out that next Sunday is our Sunday School Christmas pageant. Now, I heard a pastor refer to a Sunday School Christmas pageant as, what did she call it? Sacred Chaos? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's perfect. But whatever it turns out to be, they know, or the children in the congregation know that they are welcome here, that God loves them, that they are part of this church family. So we hope you will all come out and support us as we do our children's pageant next Sunday during the worship service, during the 1030 worship service. And that pageant will be followed by a uh, potluck luncheon in Fellowship Hall. Um, April, did you have an announcement you'd like to share? And while April comes forward, thank you for pointing out the crush, the crush festival that is taking place right now. If you start in the chapel and follow the stars on the, the arrows on the stars on the floor, it will bring you through the parlor um, and into the narthex and around here and here and around all the way to the back and then through the narthex and you will get to see the variety of nativities that people from our congregation and our friends have brought in to help us remember what we are celebrating this season. It is a wonderful, wonderful display, so take some time to look at it. Um, some people made them specifically for this crush festival, and the work in them is amazing. Um, so take some time to really look at them. They are just fascinating. And I would like to add my thanks to all of those who baked cookies and donated them for our cookie sale, for the deacons, the congregants who participated in that. Um, and uh, we too are still selling a few boxes out there so that if you didn't get a chance to come by yesterday uh, and purchase a box, all of the proceeds go toward our scholarship fund for our graduating seniors um, each uh, June. So thank you one and all for your support. As always, you are all wonderful. Uh, and uh, we're just very grateful for your support. Thank you. In your uh, church program this morning, you will also find the screen list, our prayer list. It's a very extensive list. I'd like to highlight a couple of our newer ones on the prayer list. Um, if you could keep in your prayers the family and friends of Andrew Cassidy, who died on November 21st. Andrew's family were members of our congregation many years ago, um, and if you knew Andrew, you know he was a near drown victim, um, and uh, so it, it's just um, so sad for their family to lose him at this time. I think he was 38 or 39 years old. Um, and also keep in your prayers Bev and Ernie Jones, because they will be moving to Pennsylvania to the Stroudsburg area to go into assisted living, and that brings them closer to some of their children and grandchildren. So, so take some time to look at the prayer list. Well, let us pray. Oh Lord God, be with us this Advent season. Help us know that you are here. Help us to know that you are here in the midst of so many problems in the world, ranging from wars to climate disasters. 
Help us know you are here in the midst of so much turmoil and unrest. Help us to know you are here when we are confused and frustrated. As we approach Christmas Day, help us appreciate not only you and your prophets, but also the specialness of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he means to us. And help us appreciate more than ever, not only our friends and family, but all those who sustain us and love us. Let us be more aware of each moment of life and of those special moments and memories that make life so special, so meaningful, and so much part of who we are. Let us be open to the sounds of silence, to the experiences of music. Let us be open to the love of our families and our loved ones. And in everything we do, where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. And no matter what we do, grant us the strength to, to accept the things we cannot change. The courage and strength to change the things we can. And the wisdom to know the difference between the one and the other. And now, Lord, be with us as we pray these quiet sound prayers for our friends and families and for those we don't know, for those who have lost loved ones, and for those whose loved ones are in need of prayers. Listen to these now our sound prayers. Lord, we pray knowing that you listen and that you care. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let us now make our morning offerings, knowing that it's sometimes and very, very often more blessed to give than to receive.
we have come to this place this day to worship you with our songs and with our words and with our gifts and with our whole hearts. Our reading and heeding scripture reconnect us to worship that springs from a heart filled with gratitude. Use these gifts as part of our praise and use them in mission in this world so that those who feel lost and unloved will know they have a God who loves each of them very dearly. With praise and thanksgiving, we lift up these prayers in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in memory of me. they had eaten the bread, they shared the wine. And Jesus said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Drink this in memory of me. be with us now. Be with us as we leave this place. 
as ministers to the world. Be with us as we leave this place remembering you and serving as your ambassadors of faith and pilgrims of the word. Be with us now as we share the light of Christ in our homes, in our workplaces, in every place we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.